um, senior year, or yeah, my senior year of English teacher, I despised. I will say that she always talked about, like, if you put yourself on a schedule for writing, that's not always the best. Like, some people can't just, like, have a schedule to write and then stick to that. So she was very nice about offering extensions and stuff. I mean, she said she was. Did she ever do that? I don't know. I never asked for an extension because the bitch scared the shit out of me. Even though she was legit four of a doll. Um, so anyways, I'm nervous because things are kind of fast-paced. Well, I shouldn't say fast-paced, but there's like a schedule of when things are supposed to be due. And it's like, it's tough. I My group is ahead, so it's just me and this girl. And everyone's like, oh my god, your partner's so lucky and I'm like bitch don't stroke my ego but I do know I love research and as you guys know I love doing research so I already have the topic picked out I've had it picked out since before the first day of class um, my old statistics professor told me that this would be the topic that I should do for this class because uh, I've already done an entire paper on it um, I am for this research project or research paper we are basically creating a primary research and we are doing the proposal and everything so my proposal is um, about the supplementation of antidepressant therapy for patients with major depressive disorder um, the supplementation of L-methylfolate um, the brand name for the drug is called Deplin it is indicated or FDA indicated for patients with a folate deficiency um, to increase the folate levels. It is not currently indicated as an adjunct or a supplement for antidepressant therapy. However, it's used in that sense a lot. Um, I know that there is a practice here in my city that basically prescribes it to every patient that comes in. Um, and that is absolutely um, not precedented. There is no evidence out there that proves currently I should say no researchers out there that have concluded that it is helpful in any way. So I am doing a primary study that's going to be looking at the red blood cell folate levels, which are not typically measured in clinical trials. However, they are the most accurate, um, the most accurate representation of a patient's folate levels, typically over three months. It's very similar to if you've ever heard of the hemoglobin A1C measurement for a patient's blood glucose level, um, as opposed to just a fasting blood glucose. So a serum folate level can be manipulated by diet and things like that, whereas a red blood cell folate is an average measurement over three months, and so that way it's not e as easily manipulated. Um, so we will be hopefully measuring patients' uh, red blood cell folate levels before and after treatment, um, as well as, I'm sure during the middle, I haven't decided on that part of it. I also need to decide how much I want to measure in these patients. I know that there is a grouping of genetic disorders associated with the folate cycle outside of, I mean, there's this group, but I'm sure there's other groups too, so that's why I probably don't know if I should even open this can of worms, but genetically testing these patients for the MTHFR gene mutation might be interesting to see if we can do sub-analyses with those patients. Um, and what else did I want to do? Oh, so basically we're, I think what what's going to happen is we might have four treatment groups or four different groups. Um, the first group so there is two interventions technically, an antidepressant and a folate supplement. So therefore you can have multiple different combinations. You can have patients taking an antidepressant and the folate, and that's kind of like the real, you know, st um, study or experimental that we want to see versus just an antidepressant with a placebo. Um, if you've never heard of a placebo, a placebo is basically like a sugar pill. These are medications that look exactly like the medication they're being compared with. However, they have absolutely no active ingredient in it. So you could technically have a placebo for both an antidepressant and for a folate supplement. So that's why there can be multiple groups. So you could have a, like 
I said antidepressant and placebo. Antidepressant and placebo. Antidepressant and folate. Antidepressant and placebo. Placebo and folate and placebo and placebo. So that would be four groups to compare baseline depression scores based on the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, the HDRS, or the AMD. It is like the gold standard for assessing depression in clinical trials. Um, so that would be measured before, during, and after, as well as the red blood cell folate levels before, during, and after. And I would like to see if um, folate levels in patients who are depressed are lower than patients who are not depressed. I would also like to see if um, red blood cell folate levels significantly increase after folate supplementation, which they absolutely will if we're giving them the folate that's being measured. They pretty much will be increased no matter what. And then I want to see if uh, the depression rating goes uh, down with um, anti antidepressant therapy on its own, placebo on its own, folate on its own, and folate and, and uh, the antidepressant together. I recently read a meta-analysis, a very large meta-analysis on meta-analysis. I want to, I always say meta-analysis, but that's multiple. Meta-analysis on anti the antidepressant effect versus placebo effect, and basically the researchers concluded that the difference between placebo and antidepressant is uh, so minuscule, it might not actually be any different, and they also talked about uh, the fact that the difference might be absolutely contributed to the fact of uh, bias or blind blindness being broken. One of the aspects of clinical trials, uh, specifically randomized controlled trials, is having what's called a placebo blinded placebo, double-blind placebo-controlled uh, child is, is kind of the gold standard. So double-blind means that both the patients and the researchers uh, don't know who's getting what, and therefore there is a decrease in bias in that aspect. You can also have triple um, blinding where the st statisticians also don't know who has what, um, but I read that that's really hard to do, so I probably won't do that. However, I would love to blind everyone so that there's absolutely no risk of bias, but there's always going to be some sort of risk. Um, and so by blinding, patients don't know what they have, but providers don't know either. But the tricky thing is a lot of times, well, 99% of the times, um, well, I shouldn't say 99% because this has actually been tested, but... Um, drugs themselves have side effects, and the placebo or the sugar pill does not have side effects. And so when you start a trial and you say, hi, I'm going to be putting you on an antidepressant or possibly a placebo, if a patient starts experiencing very common side effects of an antidepressant that they may know from friends or whatever, then they know they're on the antidepressant and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get better. And they're, the placebo effect is that they start feeling like they're getting better. And so it's been studied um, in a couple different ways. Uh, they've asked patients before and after a certain period of time in trials whether or not they think they're on the placebo side or the treatment side. And studies where there is side effects in the actual drug and not in the placebo, it is statistically significant. Or patients getting the treatment are statistically more significant whatever, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, and so that was further uh, further exemplified when they have used, um, instead of an inert placebo, which means that there's nothing, no side effects, no drug, they use what's called an active placebo, which is using a placebo or a sugar pill with an active ingredient of another drug that should have no effect on the um, primary outcome of the trial, but it has similar side effects. So for example, I think they used alpha blockers in some trials um, as a substitute for a placebo for antidepressants, and they have similar, some similar side effects. Um, and those patients aren't as likely to know the difference if they're in placebo or control, and therefore the response rate is more similar. Um, this was also hypothesized why one of the uh, antidepressants 
antidepressant trials or one of the antidepressants that was possibly going to be really good because it had minimal side effects was proven to be uh, clinically insignificant compared to placebo because patients didn't know what they were on and therefore probably all the patients thought they were on the placebo and you know didn't get much better or had the same results so it's a very interesting topic uh, something I haven't thought about much in my research time but now I'm kind of opening my eyes still um, so it's interesting how pro antidepressant I was and how I'm kind of like a little bit weary of them now I've talked a lot about this with my therapist with my old st uh, statistics professor and am going to be talking about it tomorrow with my psychiatrist to see what she has to say about this meta-analysis it was released in the early 2000s and had quite a bit of backlash when it was originally published you had uh, several bodies saying we knew about this lots of primary evidence out there has concluded this and then you've also had other groups including all of the pharmaceutical industries and a lot of the big um, you know the psychiatric associations saying that this is basically fraudulent um, and so you wonder how much of that is monetarily based so I'm not sure what to think of that um, there is two books I'm reading the first one is called The Emperor's New Drugs um, and that was a book published by the person who wrote that meta-analysis about the antidepressants basically describing how he went about doing the study why he went about doing the study and how there's really he's saying that there's no risk of the bias and why he did things certain ways and I found it interesting because he originally started this study uh, to focus on his uh, thesis which was literally specifically about the placebo effect and when he was doing it he was comparing the placebo effect versus the antidepressants fully thinking that it was going to be lower than antidepressants because he was a doctor himself and prescribed antidepressants and referred to psychiatrists all the time but once he started reading reading the data he was like whoa and that's kind of how i was when i started reading the data um however anytime you go against you know the norm you kind of are out on a ledge and so i feel crazy sometimes talking about it and one of the things that i was reading by peter gasich or gotsich a Swedish or a Danish I think he's Swedish a Swedish uh, doctor who was one of the co-founders of the uh, Cochrane collaboration who I respect I respect that organization so much um, he said that when you first start going about kind of looking at everything with a magnifying glass and really trying to find what the T is you know in other words um, you can't ripple the waters too much too early on because you will be immediately snuffed out so I'm nervous because I'm very young I haven't even graduated and I'm already like this is all a sham this is a scam so uh, interesting uh, I also talked to my oncology professor about the role of mammograms in the prevention of breast cancer and how interesting it is that so many bodies have come out and said that mammograms are not this amazing thing that they're said to be I think I definitely talked about this no, maybe I didn't. Um, they're not as amazing as people say they are. Obviously, they have been proven to detect some forms of breast cancers early. However, they have a high false positive rate. Um, and there were some statistics out there that I don't need to really read, but <coughs> basically saying, like, we need to reevaluate universally screening everyone starting at the age of 50 for breast cancer I'm not necessarily sure if that's an amazing idea and my uh, oncology professor who is actually a physician assistant um, in the radiation department uh, who works on breast cancer so I was like let me go to the source and I actually love this one a lot I shadowed her um, a lot in undergrad so I'm pretty close with her and I brought up all this stuff and she was like listen data is out there you know but you really can't go against the women out there who have had breast cancer you know they know how serious it is obviously there are people out there and she said like you were with me there's definitely people with breast cancer and I was like yeah I'm not denying that she's like but to say like the only thing they currently have for screening 
is a no-go you know would not be accepted um, it's crazy so you know it's interesting I definitely think there should be absolutely screening methods for all different types of cancers and diseases but there are standards out there um, that really aren't being met um, the kind of the number one thing you want to do with screening for cancers is to reduce all-cause mortality in these patients um, right below that we want to decrease mortality due to that cancer and below that we want to uh, increase the detection of that cancer early on and most of uh, or all of I should say all of the screenings pretty much do number one which is why they get approved they you know screen and detect these cancers early only some of them do number two and next to none do number three which is reducing all-cause mortality I think one of the only ones which isn't even you know foolproof is the low dose CT scan for patients with um, you know a history of smoking for lung cancer um, it's interesting but yeah so that's my little rant on research you know how I am um, a lot of the research that I was reading on um, alamethylfolate uh, augmentation for antidepressant therapy is, um, you know, they have different definitions of what's considered to be in remission or to have a clinical response. So I'm kind of trying to standardize that based on what research says is, you know, the best way to measure that. I know specifically in like 1991, one of the one clinician published a um, you know, report on how to define remission in patients being measured with uh, the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale and said that a score less than seven, seven is considered remission. And so since then, we have considered that remission in clinical trials. However, some of the research that I was reading, the researchers, you know, stated a score of 11 or 12 were considered in remission. And when I actually had done research on the Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, a lot of research today is saying that the score should be much lower, a, a, a grade of four to, four to five to be considered in remission. So it's interesting. And when I have read the research, those specific studies that have scores higher than what's considered the normal to be in remission, it's, it's funny because the experimental group meets that criteria, but the, you know, control, the patients on antidepressants alone do not meet it. So it's almost like they went after the data, after the data came through, the analyses were done. They said, oh, this group gets to 11, the antidepressant gets to 12, well, we're going to say 11 is what we're going to consider remission and consider clinically significant. And I'm like, uh -uh. you can't do that. Okay. They say it's seven, bitch, it's seven. Unless you can give me a reason otherwise. You can't just say, oh, I want 11. Um, you know, there's a lot of research out there is fraudulent, to say the least. Um, there's some research out there on pre-exposure prophylaxis for homosexual men as well as trans transgender women and men. Um, and the reduction of HIV transmission and I'm not going to get into too much on it because I haven't done a thorough investigation but some of the research that I was reading they exclude some patients in the experimental group meaning patients who got this drug that is supposed to reduce the risk of HIV they have removed patients who have gotten HIV in that group from the data set because they haven't you know, completed the right forms or had their partner complete the right forms to me as a clinician, as someone with a passion in research, that seems like they are trying to skew the results to show that their experimental drug is better than it is. Okay, you can't just throw out, you know, 13 or whatever patients with HIV in that group just because, you know, they're not filling out correct paperwork or whatever it is. Like, you need to give me a better, a better reason than that because if you included those patients, the results would be different, okay? It might not be a statistical significance between the two groups. Um, so it's interesting because, you 
know, I will say that the, the pharmaceutical industry likes to spout that pre-exposure prophylaxis is 99% effective, um, but the data is kind of all over the place, um, and it's interesting to see some of the other aspects, some of the other factors going into that other STD transmission, um, you know, uh, protection use in those patients might be lower because they think that this, you know, prevents against other diseases, just making sure that the education is there, the patient education. So interesting, just some things that I've read in my time or <coughs> some things I've seen in my time while reading research. Don't know why I'm rambling about research. I could ramble about this shit all fucking day. Um, but it's funny, a lot of my friends um, have been calling me and asking for help because it's tough because you have to kind of formulate a question or formulate a research topic that really hasn't been done before. Thankfully, this topic, although it's been researched before, has not been done well. Um, so, like I said, no one's really measured red blood cell folate, you know, they're measuring other things, homocysteine levels, like, I won't even get into that, but, you know, fraudulent, not fraudulent, I shouldn't say that, but it's just bad, bad medicine, so, um, I'm doing something different, measuring different things, measuring before and after, which uh, hasn't been done, but a lot of my friends are like, oh, I just want to compare these two drugs, and I'm like, well, I, I'm assuming that's been compared before. Um, you know, you gotta do something new, bring something new to the table, you know, fill in a, a gap in medicine. So I think that's a little tough for some people who, you know, don't read or don't have a topic that they've been researching a lot and know a lot about. Um, so we're getting there with a couple different groups of, of friends of mine. So that's that on that. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I'm trying to think of things like that I can do. I have been tossing back and forth the idea of doing a negative affirmations video. I don't think I want to, although it was a really funny idea. I just can imagine it would be triggering. I don't think I could watch that, even though it was funny. It's almost like those bitchy, you know, enter whatever title here, um, role play. I don't know. I don't personally like that. I know some people do, and some people find it funny, but I just can't imagine it would trigger people, and I don't mean to post any content that would trigger anyone, so I think I'm going to scrap that idea. I know I've been talking about that forever, um, so yeah, so I thought I would just do this little video. I'm going to do some more work. Um, I've got class tomorrow. We are getting the results back on a hypothetical patient, a 76-year-old male presenting to the emergency department with a month, one month history of cough. Um, he is a hypertensive, high cholesterol patient um, with, what else can I say, a hypertensive, high cholesterol patient uh, with a family history of heart disease, heart attacks, um, and on physical exam, he has, uh, I think it's aortic stenosis, as well as some pitting edema, so I'm pretty sure the patient has acute CHF. Oh, he has bilateral basal rails as well, so clinical uh, suspicion is very high for congestive heart failures that we're going to see after our echo EKG. I think we got a um, brain natriuretic peptide, troponins, uh, I think we did a stress test maybe. We did another sleep study for God's sake. Um, and hopefully we can get the patient on uh, a low-dose diuretic right now to relieve some of his fluid and then get him on, I don't know, maybe a beta blocker um, or an a I think probably an ACE inhibitor to help forward flow with the aortic stenosis. Maybe he has to go for a I don't Lots of options, lots of treatment options for heart failure. Um, so yeah, we're going to see about that patient tomorrow. And I got to tell you, I have such a crush on my professor. I don't know if I told this story somewhere. I feel like I have, but I don't remember. Um, every two weeks we get a new professor. So after Wednesday, next Wednesday, I'll get a new professor who I don't know who I'm with. Speaking of, oh, I think it's, I don't know who it is. Um, but this professor is a younger PA who works in the emergency department. He is very handsome, and he 
everyone I have an issue with people pleasing and I always have but I'm working on 